My name's David Christopher. Uh, I was, I'm an old Rydean. I think that's the first time I've ever called myself an old Rydean. Uh, but I was, I was there for, oh gosh, I guess, I don't know, something like 10 years of my life. Um, very fond memories. And since then, I've had... And since then, <laughs> I've had um, a somewhat interesting uh, career path. And I've, I've done all sorts of different things. And I consider myself to be a little unusual. But um, I do feel that I have some gleaned some wisdom over that time, especially for anybody who's interested in the, the craft of, of writing and um, is interested in the sacrifices that, that you have to make if you really want to do anything at uh, a really high level. So I do have some credits to my name. Uh, I've about a dozen short stories published in, in magazines and journals. I've had two plays produced uh, in London in small theatres, one of which transferred to a squat in the West End, <clears throat> which was unusual, but pretty awesome. Uh, and I've had, I, I was a journalist as well um, for a while. I have a master's in journalism and I have uh, been published in the Times. I worked there very briefly. Uh, and the Financial Times, um, Press Gazette, and a, a bunch of others. So I can write, um, but that's no proof. So I'm going to do a quick reading for you from um, my first full-length novel that I've just, I've actually just finished. And yesterday my son, uh, who's five, handed me a, a, a little book. It was like seven pages that he'd stapled together. And it was, uh, on the front it said, uh, Finn Christopher's lightsaber story. And then it was five pages of uh, drawings of basically two characters fighting with lightsabers. And it was beautiful, wonderful. It's the first book he's ever written. And uh, I looked at it and I thought, oh crap, he beat me to it. Uh, I've been writing my book since before he was born. And he's written a book and he beat me to it. So um, it's, uh, it's a hard, hard, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I've done quite a lot of hard things in my life. So anyway, I'm going to give you a quick reading. Uh, this book, the series is called Our Ends. Uh, it's, in, sh in, in brief, it's a post-apocalyptic um, book. It's new adult fiction. So it's aimed at, um, you know, recent college, uh, uh, people who are co at college and who are out starting their lives. And, okay, here we go. Dad's never been in a fight like that. Lived in London his whole life and never had to fight anyone. Hurry, Faye says. Her voice has a thinness, like the sound is going in instead of coming out. He lived in worse than this. Yay, Dad, Sean says. Don't give these jobs an excuse, I tell him. That's what they're looking for. Sean snorts. You are lucky the old man got in the way. There could be you in the backseat. We pull to a stop at the noose of roads around Vauxhall Station. Keep going, Faye says. I tell her it's a red light. Does she want me to run a red? An old woman has collapsed beneath the sign for bus stop G. Her floral print dress is bunched up around her waist, so I can't see her face. A man in a suit crouches over her, phone to his ear, looking only mildly concerned while on the bench, just a few feet away, a young Asian woman in a skirt suit and surgical mask strokes the screen of her phone. Someone honks behind us. The lights have changed. My foot trembles on the clutch and the car lurches forward, like in that recurring dream I have where I'm driving downhill with Faye and Sean and the brakes stop working. I tap the brakes now just to be sure. What are you doing? Faye says. Don't do that. Just let me drive, I say. You're jiggling him. Both of you stop fighting, Sean shouts. The shopkeeper's car must be 30 years old. It smells of sweat and tobacco. And every time we hit a bump in the road, my head touches the roof. I try to keep to my lane, but the lanes merge and I don't understand who has right of way. I stop so we don't get hit, but so does the other lane and the asshole behind me leans on his horn again. Shit. All these cars trying to be somewhere and we're just in the way. I gun the engine and lurch off. A car cuts us up without indicating and I break. Easy, Faye says. I've heard her called a bitch at school. I tried to stick up for her, but there's a part of me that likes to hear it. Seatbelts on, I ask. 
Sean tugs at his in the passenger seat beside me. Yeah, he glances over his shoulder at Faye in the back seat. Is your belt on? When she doesn't answer, he pulls himself some slack and turns around with his knee up on the seat to look at her. Don't do that, I tell him. Ah, oh, Sean says. Language. I try to sound shocked, like Dad would. Sean, I snap my fingers. Did they answer yet? Sean, I need you, mate. Head in the game. What, he says. And then, the shopkeeper's dying, isn't he? Don't look at that. He tilts his head. You ever seen someone die? I push his face away, rough enough to snap him out of it. What's happening? The phone, did they pick up yet? He looks at me with that fierce look like he's about to lose it. I tighten my grip on the steering wheel in case he does. What's happening on the phone, I say, deliberately calm. He puts it back to his ear. They're not answering, he says. Damn pigs. Faye is whispering to the shopkeeper. I glance over my shoulder and see her bent over double with her mouth to his ear. The white skirt from her sports bag lost somewhere in the puddle of blood in her lap. She looks at me, mascara streaked down her cheeks, and I can see in her eyes that the old man is already dead. Nearly there, I say. Sean screams. There's a car in our lane, an oncoming car, its big grill flashing like knives. I jump on the brake and our wheels lock and we skid. The car swerves away, and for a second there's hope, then it swerves back towards us. The driver isn't looking where she's going. Her head is down on the steering wheel, and her curly-haired lapdog has one paw up on the dash and one on her cheek, licking at her face. It's the last thing I see before the crash. Then our seatbelts snap tight in unison. The steering wheel smacks me in the nose, and the pain is sudden and shocking. When my eyes open, the world is tilted. We're spinning. Sean is slipping out of his seatbelt, and I reach out to push him back, but the old man appears between us. Now his blood is splattered all over the inside of the car, or maybe it's mine. He floats over the handbrake, and I see Faye anchoring him to the back seat, her fingers around his belt. He stretches out limp as a sleeping cat, his jowls slack, and his eyes roll back in his head. His fingertips brush the dashboard as if... He were checking for dust. Then we hit a tree. The seatbelt snap again, like a punch in the gut, and the old man explodes out through the windscreen and rolls in the grass. So that's the intro, you know, the very first chapter. It starts um, right in the action, and it kind of goes from there. <laughs> Uh, essentially, it's the story of how these three siblings survive through an apocalypse in which all adults die. And from then, adults continue to die, and there are only children. And it's about the stories, that it's the story of the years after that happens, the many years uh, in which civilization has to retool itself for life ending at around 17 or 18 years. It's about how human beings, it's about the death of childhood and it's about how human beings um, come together and, and how all of us fight between the polars of uh, darkness and light and how chaos and order um, battle in these end times. It came from, I read, um, the Lord of the Flies, and I finished reading it, and at the end of The Lord of the Flies, something happens called a deus ex machina, which is essentially where, it comes from uh, ancient Greek playwriting, where uh, the god in the machine is, is, is what it translates as, and what it means is that we see God in the machine, and an ending happens when uh, it comes from, they literally used to lower down one of the gods, and they would basically tie up all the loose ends with magical powers. So the idea is, it's an ending which, um, rather than the characters having to sort it out for themselves, an external force comes in and sorts things out. And I felt that um, The Lord of the Flies was like that. Uh, chaos happens, these kids are on this island, and they're having to figure it out for themselves. Um, violence ensues, 
and there's just incredible sort of hostility and, and we see humanity laid bare. And then at the end, the adults come and rescue them and everything's fine again. But I didn't want that. What I wanted to explore was how do children learn how to be adults quicker? And how do they establish civilization? And how do they prevent brutality from reigning uh, in these kind of times? So that's the book. I'm super interested. This is the first time I've ever read from it. I'm super interested in your feedback and your thoughts. So that's my Twitter handle. Um, you can also get my email address from Sean. If you have any thoughts, any ideas on that, if you like practical criticism, you know, I'm totally open. So I hated it. Like, here's why. I would love to receive that email or anything else. You know, I enjoyed it. And here's why. Have you thought about this, um, etc. Okay, so there's a reading just so you can get a flavor for, the, for, for my writing, which I would describe as Generic, this is the first time I've described it, so uh, generic literary. So um, right now I'm in a genre very much, as I expressed, um, which is a new emerging genre called, um, called uh, new adult. <clears throat> so that's really in the last couple of years that genre has started to come out and it's being pushed by independently published authors predominantly. But I'm also here in the genre of science fiction maybe, uh, certainly in, in the genre of uh, apocalyptic fiction. So I'm in numerous genres, uh, but I also feel like I have a literary bent um, that I, I really care about my sentences and my words. And originally I wrote literature um, or attempted to write literature. <laughs> it wasn't really literature. Uh, it was my best attempt at literature. Um, but, but now what I've done is I've tried to um, get really good at story. And so I'm put it, pushing these two things together and what, what the output feels more like um, two of my favorite books, The Stand by Stephen King and, uh, and sort of Frank Herbert's June. That also there's a, it feels a little bit like um, the... Um, Hunger Games, but, but, but maybe more real. Uh, you know, there's swearing and things, as you observe. And maybe also, um, you know, there are other influences in there as well, but I, I won't go too deeply into that. <clears throat> but you can tell just from the way that I explain that, that, um, that this book and me, myself as a writer are coming out of something, are coming out of a lot of things that I'm not just a sort of appearing out of nowhere. Um, I am attempting to stand on the shoulders of giants. That I'm aware of my own sort of literary uh, history. I've read deeply and widely. I have a great respect for other writers. And, and I've read about how they write and their process. And I've thought about my own writing and I've thought about my own story. And uh, I say that just to illustrate the amount of headspace that, that bringing writing in a serious way into your life takes up. Um, you are creating worlds with, with ideally fully functioning people, people who live, appear to live and breathe and be animated without you or beyond you. And that's when you really know that a character has come alive when they surprise you as you write. And you can imagine the amount of mental bandwidth that that takes to create those worlds in your life. And for me, as a, a marketer, so now I'm in, in marketing, um, for me, a lot of the struggle of writing is the balance between the three core facets of my life, which are writing, write, uh, marketing, which is my career, and my family. And part of what I want to kind of talk to you about is that too. Because I believe that the practice, I believe that great writing comes from, uh, great empathetic writing comes from a position of mat maturity and that maturity comes from a thoroughly lived life. Okay. So here we go. What is writing? For me, writing is meaning supported by style. You need both of these things. So I'm going to go into both. Meaning is something worth saying. 
You need um, to, at the end of the day, be illuminating something of worth for people, in my opinion. Delivered with impact, so style. You need to have um, the ability to uh, create, render a world and render characters and render a story that is sufficiently compelling to bring people through um, so that you can deliver the impact of that meaning. Part one, style. This is a guy whose surname I can't pronounce, but his first name is Paddy. If I have anything to say to young writers, it's stop thinking of writing as art, think of it as work. For the longest time I thought of writing as art. I, want, I, was, I waited around for inspiration. I waited for the, for, the thing, um, for the great thing that I had to say. But that's not how it works. In order to create the, your, your stylistic muscles, in order to basically be able to um, create a vehicle for a message, you need to write a lot, a lot, so much. So you just got to get in and write. And the more you write, the more you'll be basically refining your abilities. It's, it's an art like, it's, it's a, a craft like anything else, and it takes time. So get to it. And don't be precious about it. You know, don't think of yourself, um, basically invite other people in to kind of uh, read your stuff, learn from them, and, and grow. This is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his 24-hour cycle um, of life. So he's sleeping for five hours, he's working for 12 hours, and he's cramming in uh, a couple of hours of personal time in the evenings. That's what it takes to create enough time that you can really master an art. And for a long time, I was, I was writing like that until basically I ran out of money uh, I needed a, uh, I, I fell in love and it was time for me to start a family. And now my writing routine looks a little different and I'll share that with you later. But there were, there was about five years, no, I'm sorry, it was probably more like about, yeah, it was about five years. Five years when I was writing full time um, and I was supporting myself with a waiting job. And this was very much what my schedule looked like. This is um, a poem, the first two lines of a poem that I wrote um, and then I submitted for a school competition, and that won the school competition. Flesh falls from the mind's eye, bare and beautiful. It was called Cotton Flesh, and it was my best work at 16. Uh, I found it in a journal recently uh, when I went back home, and I was just like, Ooh. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing now. Um, and that's okay, you know? Um, you need to get that stuff out of you. Um, you need to, 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 to write in order to grow. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, and in it, he suggested that 10,000 hours of practice is, the, is required to achieve the level of mastery associated with being a world-class expert at anything. That's two hours per day for 14 years. So he looked at sports, um, sports stars, he looked at uh, world-class violinists, he looked at writers, he looked at the Beatles, um, he looked at all sorts of different... Um, artists and craftsmen and and this is what he found and i say this so that you realize that you, i've been a bad writer for very many years and only now i'm probably about fifteen thousand hours in only now do i feel like i am starting to really get it there is a chance that you're a genius um and that you can just hit the ground running and immediately you're just brilliant. Um, it's, a, it's a really, it's very unlikely. There's a much greater chance that you're not a genius, um, like me, and that you're gonna take, it's gonna take time. So just be aware going into it that it does take time and it takes sacrifices. So um, I, I went to university I tried to get into drama school. I was sort of Sean's star pupil in my year. Um, and I tried to get into drama school and, and it didn't work out for me. And, and I'm really glad. I, I then sort of transitioned to writing while I was at university. I did a management degree and, and I hated it. 
Um, and I did creative writing while I was doing this management degree. And what I learned was um, that I love to write. I started to produce plays and then direct plays instead. And then I started to write plays. So when I graduated university, I had two options in front of me. I could take a job at HSBC at a starting salary of around £36,000. And, and it would grow pretty quickly as well. Or I could take $10 an hour doing catering. And you know what I chose, right? I chose the 10, 10 pounds an hour uh, doing catering. And this, this isn't actually my bedroom, <laughs> but uh, I didn't take a picture of the bedroom that I was in, uh, in London when I did that. And I should have, but it looked a lot like this. It, I, it was actually smaller. Um, I had a futon mattress and in order to uh, lie down, I had to walk into the bedroom, close the door, and only then could I put the mattress down on the floor because otherwise the mattress would block the door. And then I had a bookcase just full of books, a big bookcase uh, and a desk that again, I couldn't sit at unless the, the bed was up. So it was either an office or a bedroom. And I did that for many years. Um, and I wrote, I wrote like hell and I grew. But at the end of the day, I had some things to show for it, and I've already shared those with you. Um, and really, I primed myself for a career in communications, one way or another, and, and I decided to make a move into journalism. But during that time, and right now, there's no reason why you shouldn't be reading a lot. Uh, reading, by reading, you get to, to, to do a couple of really important things. Firstly, you get to see how it's done. You get to, um, you get to tune your brain to great writing, and you get to analyze, um, how, you know, the formula, basically. You also get to explore the different t voices and the different things that can be done with literature so that you can hone in on the kinds of voices that attract you. And you'll end up, you'll find early on that you'll start to write like those folks. Um, and that's appropriate. Just you know, lean into that. You can kind of borrow their styles for a while as you find your own. But the other thing is that you'll be communing with just, you'll basically be growing as a human being because what you're doing is you're learning from great minds. Enjoy the serendipity of reading. When I was at school, Sean Evans gave me this book, 1984 by George Orwell. It's not one of my favorite books. I read it and I kind of liked it. I appreciated, you know, the, uh, I appreciated kind of the thought that went into that. Um, but it did lead me to some other books, it led me to A Clockwork Orange and to The Time Machine. And they in turn led me to other books, to J.G. Ballard. And, and I started to sort of get a little bit more interested here into William Burroughs and now, I mean, this is some racist stuff, but now I'm like, okay, that is kind of amazing. And to Franz Kafka, and through the, the more science fiction-y sort of vein, to Aldous Huxley in A Brave New World, which I, I loved, and then Slaughterhouse-Five and Kurt Vonnegut Jr., which I still love, and then to sort of modern American, um, the modern American novel, the great modern American novel, through Joseph Heller and Catch-22, and that has been a whole world that, that I just, that's really where my favorite writing probably is. Um, so enjoy the serendipity of writing and look for the next step. And, and it's pretty easy to, 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 to find that next step um, if you're deliberate about the way that you read. And if you don't enjoy something after 60 pages, just start reading, you know, because life is too short. Um, this is your opportunity to commune with humanity's brightest minds. You're looking for lifetime friends here, and these people are giving you their best. And you can take that, and the very best, your very favorite books, you'll find them, yourself reading them again over the years, because you're really creating friends. Um, and by so doing, you really are growing as a human, because who can teach you better than these people?
the reason you should stop after 60 pages, unless you have to write a paper on it, is this is 51 years worth of reading. If you read a book a week, from 25 until the day you are more than likely to die. It's not much. Very few people read a book a week. I used to. Now, <laughs> now I'm probably down to a book every couple of months, just because of the way life is, um, how busy I am. But look at that, it's not much. Each one is precious. Choose carefully. Okay, this is one of my favorite quotes about creativity. All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. I want to play you a little bit of uh, video right now. Let me know if you can't hear the audio. This guy, before I do that though, this guy, Ira Glass, he is a radio um, guy. He's on NPR over here, which is like BBC Radio 4. And he has the very best podcast and radio show in the world, as far as I'm concerned, for storytellers. It's called This American Life, and you should absolutely start listening to it if storytelling or radio or podcasting is something that you're interested in. Every week, it's basically just amazing, tr generally amazing true stories from uh, America. And the, it's just, they're very artfully told, and you can see from this um, that he's a very uh, smart storyteller. Nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste, but it's like there's a gap, that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, you're a, your taste is still killer, and your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while. And you just have to fight your way through that. Okay. Yeah. So there's that. Okay, back to the slideshow. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. All right, so how about some actual practical tips here, David? Um, <laughs> this is all very esoteric. I'm not going to give you many, honestly, but I'll give you a few. A few of the sort of gems that have come to me uh, over the years. This comes from Stephen King's On Writing. He talks about, he actually gives a really uh, interesting sort of anecdote about his uncle who was really handy around the house. And um, he was at his house and his uncle needed to, to fix the screen on his window, which he, we have in houses in America to stop bugs coming in through the windows when the windows are open. And it's a really simple fix, right? You, you need a screwdriver more than likely. And um, his uncle went and got his huge toolbox and he took it around the house. He walked it all that way, lugged this big toolbox and he sat it down. He took out one tool, the screwdriver, fixed up the blind, the um, screen, put it back in the toolbox, picked his toolbox back up again, started lugging it away. And Stephen King, 
the young Stephen King said to his uncle, uncle, why, why didn't you just bring the screwdriver? And his uncle said, I didn't know what this job would take. When I got out here, it could have been bigger than just a screwdriver. And what Stephen King recommends writers need to do is they need to build their writing toolboxes. And that there are different levels of toolbox, <clears throat> of your toolbox. There are tools at the top, like a screwdriver, that you're gonna need all the time. <clears throat> Regular tools. Things like vocabulary and grammar. In short, he recommends that your vocabulary, you shouldn't be seeking to expand your vocabulary massive, massively. You should just be reading. And when it comes time to use your vocabulary, you should use the simplest, most impactful word that you can in any situation. So it's not about long, complicated words. That's pretentious. It's about the most impactful word, the word which is just going to support the story um, in the best possible way. <clears throat> and as for grammar, I, I have one recommendation for you on the next slide. And then below that level of to the toolbox, there are the structure of um, the elements that you're going to use to make up um, your chapters, which are paragraphs and sentences. And, you know, you need your paragraphs to um, have an arc in and of themselves. There needs to be a satisfying um, movement of action from paragraph to paragraph. The paragraphs need to lead well to the next. And the same goes for sentences. They need to work well to, with each other. An individual sentence needs to have... Um, needs to be able to stand alone in a sense and be beautiful in and of its own right, or at least impactful, it needs to work. And then below that, there are things like tempo, um, fragments, beats, um, tools that you'll use less often, um, but you might use a fragment or a frag, for example, a short sentence that is not grammatically correct for impact. Um, you might use a beat, you might um, be thinking about the um, the basically the moments in which there is silence and pause and uh, impactful um, pauses in your work and pulling these sort of more more sort of niche tools out from the bottom of your toolbox. On grammar, uh, he recommends this book, The Elements of Style. Gra I hate grammar so much, and I'm not good at it. Um, but over time. As you write, one of the things that happens is the edges kind of come off your idiosyncratic, you know, use of grammar. You basically start to learn grammar. Um, and for me, that's been a, more of a natural process because I'm dyslexic and I struggled really hard even just learning to read, but I overcame it and I still can't spell, but you know, th this whole thing is difficult for me, but I'm so fired up about getting my message across that I've managed to overcome it as best I can. So here's Stephen King's On Writing. If you're gonna read one book about writing, I would recommend this book. Good writing is often letting go of fear and affectation, he says. It's really simple. And that's the process for a young writer. A lot of that is writing through all of that affectation. And as Ira Glass says, noticing how bad your own writing is. Um, you'll probably love it at first. And then a couple of weeks later, you will uh, realize you know, how bad it was, or at least maybe a year later, and, and grow because of that. You've got to kill the cliches, all of them. The first thing, you are probably not a genius. The first thing that you put on the paper will probably be really bad. And um, over time, you've got to get good at, at noticing cliches so that you can erase them. And you're trying to find your voice, which is that which is authentically you. Okay? So... I want, when I read your writing, I want to feel like I'm having an intimate conversation with a brilliant storyteller or somebody who is fascinating. And if you can do that for me, then, you, then I don't care about your grammar, really. I don't care about, you can make spelling mistakes for, for all I care. Um, I don't recommend it, but you can, because there'll be something very compelling there, which is um, people will feel that they have met you met an interesting human being um, and that they are communing with 
uh, somebody in, in a way that we don't necessarily get all that much in everyday life. So seek that authenticity. But there's a second part of that statement for me, which is, uh, I'll give you a quick anecdote. When I was doing creative writing at um, university, there was a guy in the class who wrote very beautifully. He would create these little passages about um, pieces of glass. I remember one. Um, it was like a little ornament. There was a turtle in it, and the light shone through it in a really beautiful way. And it was a beautifully turned passage. But his writing was so boring. Um, really, he never went anywhere. Um, and the problem, and he as a person, frankly, was quite boring, quite a dull person. And I, didn't, I never wanted to have a conversation with him, you know. Um, I never wanted to get into a conversation with him because I would generally be bored. And the problem that, and one time he said to me, how do you do this? You know, how do you, how do you come up with all these stories? And where, where I was, was I was writing all these fascinating weird stories but the opposite but my writing was horrible um and he looked at me and he was like how do you do that because that's what i need and i kind of looked at him and i thought if i could just get that beauty into my writing that that would be great um but of the two of us i think i think he had the raw deal um or he had the bigger job ahead of him the bigger road ahead of him was he had to learn how to be an interesting person which i think is a challenge <laughs> um so but it's not, it's, not possible to, it's not impossible to overcome. And, and by digging deep and going through uh, almost a sort of therapy, maybe even, um, he may have been able to kind of come up with that. But if you reveal what is authentically you, be aware that hopefully what is authentically you, you need to be growing as a person daily in order that what is authentically you be interesting enough to hold people's attention. I need to say something about editing. This is a great book, The Artful Edit, on the practice of editing yourself. Don't think that other people will do the job of editing you. You need to be edit you need to get great at editing yourself. For me, writing, I, I will write a passage and, and by the time I have edited it, not a single word of that passage may exist. It's, you know, I write and I rewrite and I rewrite obsessively. And it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but uh, but I'm a great editor now. So when so I have friends who write who are professional writers, and even my, my best friend is a um, story is a, a creative writing teacher at a university, and he sends me his stuff because he knows that I can edit really well, um, and I can do that to myself, and that's a wonderful thing. In the artful edit, um, two different types of editing uh, kind of uh, she suggests there are two different types. There's the macro edit, which is where you read your work like a reader for the first time, and you think about the themes and the characters and the pacing and things like that. And then there's the micro-edit. There's the paragraphs, lines, and words. And as a young writer, I got really hung up on the micro-edit. For the first five years, I was trying to figure out how to write beautifully turned phrases. And often they were purple, they were pretentious. And then for the, next, for the last 10 years, I realized, at that point, I realized that my stories were quite they weren't grand or they didn't really draw people in and people didn't love them. They loved the writing, but they didn't love the stories. And story is so important, especially if you want to reach a larger audience. And so then I started to think about the macro edit. And the last 10 years for me have really been about, about mastering, not mastering, but get, trying to get good at the macro edit. I'm trying to get good at these things like storytelling, like themes, characters, and pace. And I believe that I've, I've gotten better at that with the, with the last book that I've written. So let's talk a little bit about drama, which is ritual, ritual interrupted. I couldn't find who said that, but somebody said that. Um, there's a ritual to life. And often the beginnings of drama is that your, your main character's ritual is interrupted in a fundamental way that prevents that ritual from continuing to occur. Their life is disrupted and they're taken on a journey which ultimately leads them to confront one of their deepest um, challenges uh, that is inherent in their personality and either overcome it, which is um, the positive, or be overcome by it, which is often a tragedy then ensues. 
So create that moment of a ritual interrupted. It's also known as an inciting incident in a book called Story that I'm going to tell you about in a second. I am, me and my whole family, and in fact, English people in general, tend to be conflict averse. We don't necessarily love fighting people and, uh, you know, calling people out on stuff. But to, you have to get comfortable with conflict if you're going to write drama. And drama, by drama, I mean dramatic situations, which is at the core of any strong muscular narrative. People having conflict. So you've got to set up conflict and you've got to lean into that conflict. Here's a um, story by Robert McKee. This is the book that you should start reading if you're interested in writing um, screenplays. The function of structure is to provide progressively building pressures that force characters into more and more difficult dilemmas where they must make more and more difficult risk-taking choices and actions, gradually revealing their true natures even down to the unconscious self. So you've got to think, what's the worst thing that could happen to this character? For example, an orphan's adopted parents are murdered. Well, that sucks for an orphan. He discovers he has powers with the help of a wise old man. A dark lord kills the wise old man. God, that's like a terrible thing to happen to this orphan. A dark lord, the dark lord reveals that he is the boy's father. Oh man, the dark lord tries to turn the boy to evil. Could it get any worse? The, the boy is in the worst situation that you could imagine for this poor orphan. The boy resists and turns the Dark Lord to good, and order is restored to the galaxy. It's the story of Star Wars, but it's also the archetypal story for the majority of archetypal stories. And look at how cleanly it's constructed. This, these are the worst things that could happen to an orphan. And ultimately, this narrative is designed to push him to make the kind of choice that is the most difficult for him. He has to reject his father, which for an orphan is very difficult. That's one choice. Reject his father. Or, sorry, reject his father and embrace good. Or turn to evil. And, <laughs> sorry, reject his father embrace good and die, or turn to evil. And that's a tough choice, right? But he, he decides that he's going to die. He's going to take the difficult choice. So even at the, the very hot, most difficult moment, he makes that choice. And um, I like to think of this as a, an onion. You're unwrapping an onion, and you're trying to get even to their unconscious desires and actions. By the end of Star Wars, we know that Luke is good to the point of death. And that's where you've got to get your characters. Love this quote about character, my favorite quote about character and possibly about life. F. Scott Fitzgerald scribbled this in the notes of the last tycoon, a novel that was never published. Action is character. Character is not what you say your characters are. It is what they do demonstrably. And that goes for you as a human being. What is the essential ingredient to all drama? This was a question that was posed to me um, at the Royal Court Young Writers Program, which is a fabulous program. If you ever live in London and you want to be a writer, a playwright, or any kind of writer, honestly, get into this program. You will watch a ton of awesome plays. If you're not interested in that, just go to the Royal Court, the most fabulous theatre. Okay, so here's a clue. To this question, right? What is the essential ingredient to all drama? This is the guy that told me that. His name is Simon, Simon Stevens. Um, he's written plays at the National and he just wrote the uh, screenplay for The Curious Incident, The Dog in the Nighttime. Wonderful writer. And, you know, he and I, we didn't get along. And at one point we fought and he stole my girlfriend. Now, none of that is true, okay? All of that is a lie. But the answer to the question is people, right? That is what all drama has to have. And I gave you that through an illustration, right? 
At this point, you were probably pretty bored, right? It's esoteric. What's the ingredient to all drama? At this point, you were a little bit engaged. I'd given you a setting. Then I gave you a person, okay? And at that point, you're probably more engaged. A human face was looking at you. And then I set up a situation of conflict. We didn't get along. He stole my girlfriend. It was bullshit. But it illustrated the point, right? That you need people and you need drama. And that through that, we as human beings will get engaged with the story. This is the traditional arc of a story. You see a lot of stories will have this. There's an inciting incident at the beginning in Act 1 where stuff changes and somebody's sent on a journey. There's a confrontation and a climax where a decision has to be made, made and then a resolution happens. That's the visualization of what I was explaining with Star Wars before. A lot of what I'm talking about here is archetypal storytelling. Uh, it's based on uh, Jung's archetypes. This is a fabulous book. You probably want to wait until you're about 25 to read it. It's called Man and His Symbols. And it's all about these archetypes. Okay, so here are some archetypes. Um, there's the hero. And, the, and by archetype, what I mean is, or what Jung means, is these are, um, these are patterns which are ingrained in our subconsciouses. Um, in human subconsciouses because of basically evolution. So because of the way that we have evolved, every human being recognizes these different archetypes and, and, and characters are a type of archetype. So the hero, we recognize instinctively the hero and the hero's journey. The wise old man. This is, uh, R2-D2 is uh, the magical creature. You see that a lot in Native American um, storytelling. My wife is Native American, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, the Dark King, uh, or the Dark Father, uh, more, more, more specifically. This is um, a wonderful book about storytelling. It's huge. You probably want to wait again until you're... I read it when I was 25, and then I read it again when I was 35, and only at 35, and I got more out of it then. It's about a thousand pages or something like that. But here are the seven basic archetypal plots. Overcoming the monster, think Jurassic Park with Jaws. Rags to Riches, think Cinderella. The Quest, The Hobbit. Voyage and Return, The Time Machine. Comedy, Middlemarch, Tragedy, Macbeth, Rebirth, A Christmas Carol. They, there are patterns in storytelling, and it's because of archetypes. And some stories even manage to encapsulate nearly all of these. So The Lord of the Rings has all of them apart from comedy. It's not a very funny book. But there's a counterpoint to this, okay? This is David Hare, he's a playwright. The audience is bored. It can predict the exhausted UCLA film school formula, acts, arcs, and personal journeys from the moment that they start cranking. It's angry and insulted by being offered so much young for beginners, courtesy of Joseph Campbell. All great work is now outside genre. So I don't agree with this statement. I do think that playwrights often agree with this statement, um, but their story snobs. I think the rest of us, we love archetypal storytelling to this day. And these are some examples of super popular, right now, archetypal stories. Know that your subconscious has power. Stephen King talks about, um, he thinks of his muse not as some airy, lofty um, person, but he thinks of his muse as he, of his, of walking down into the basement and knuckling down to write, and his muse is this... I, can't, I think it's something like a fat guy with a cigar who either shows up or doesn't. And when he shows up, it's great. And when he doesn't, it's terrible. But um, what all he can do is, is start writing. And that muse is your subconscious in many ways. And know that your subconscious has power. So often you will set a, you'll have a problem and then you'll find the solution you know, whilst your subconscious is working at night or a, you know, you're in the shower or something. So Christopher Booker from The Seven Basic Plots said, these values, like the archetypal structures which shape stories, are programmed into our unconscious in a way we cannot modify or control. The essential message implicit in that programming is that the central goal, and you guys should listen to this, the central goal of any human life is to achieve the state of perfect balance, which we recognize as maturity, and how the central enemy in reaching that goal is our own capacity to be held back by the deforming and ultimately self-destructive power of egocentricity. Be at war with your ego. 
mature. Your writing will improve. Here's some ammo for that journey. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And The Art of Loving by Eric Fromm. If you can overcome your ego, you have a shot at writing great, empathetic literature. The truly great novels. And I would count the stand among that. Like these are written by empaths. People who can understand other human beings, get inside their, their heads and live as them through their writing. I used to say, I, I used to be way egotistical about this. I used to say, I'm a writer. I tell everybody for like seven years, I tell everybody that I was a writer. Look at me, I'm pretty, that's just, I'm so annoying. And I wrote a play called A Dog Has Died Inside Me. Okay, which is a man sits alone in his flat, haunted by memories of his dead wife, whom he hated. This is the work of ego. Today, I'm a father and a marketer. That's, what I, that's how I tell people what I tell people that I am. And I just wrote my first full-length novel called Our Ends, which you just heard a little bit about, which is about three siblings trying to re-establish civilization in a world without adults. It's a much grander narrative. It comes from a position of maturity. It's about overcoming ego. It's not about succumbing to ego. It has been said that there is no more somber enemy to good art than the pram in the hall. That's miserable. That is a miserable way to look at life. The art is more important than actually living your life to loving other people, to having children. This is what he said later in his life. Approaching 40, sense of total failure. Never will I make that extra effort to live according to the reality which alone makes good writing possible. Hence, the manic depressiveness of my style, which is either bright, cruel, and superficial, or pessimistic, moth-eating with self-pity. He never got over that. He was still trying to live some kind of imagined writer's life, um, and he was writing egocentrically as a result. And he was miserable. It's a trap. This is Andrea Dunbar, a genius, a genius who committed suicide. Um, she wrote uh, The Arbor. She was, a, she was a drug addict. She locked her kids in her bedroom by taking the handle off the door so that she could write in peace. Her personal life, her Wikipedia page, is um, very depressing. My point is that there are a lot of people think that art and that being a writer and being an artist is about being a tortured genius. And I think that the path of egocentric writing is somewhat about that. It's about disappearing inside yourself. It's about not maturing. But I think that's a miserable life. I would encourage you to try and mature, to try and grow, and as a writer and as a human being, so that you can grow as a writer. I recommend, um, for me, what works is the this path, right? So this is Prince Albert and his nine children uh, at Osborne House. And what he did was he had a golden hour and every morning he would get up early and he would do his architecture right, work. And that Osborne House on the Isle of Wight is um, what came out of that. So that's kind of marvelous, right? So this is now my routine. I write for two hours in the morning. I edit on the way to work, in the car, I have Siri read me my writing and I make notes in Siri. Then I work for nine hours at work as a marketer, I have two and a half hours of family time, an hour of spouse time, I sleep for seven hours and I get up and I do it again. I write seven days a week, every day of the year, excepting Christmas Day. Uh, and that's how I get my time in. So it is an incredible commitment. It's going to be the third thing in your life if you, if you make it. But it's also a keystone habit. Psychologists call it this because what that does is by waking up every morning and doing that, and you can achieve the same thing by going to the gym every morning, you basically give yourself incredible resources of self-discipline, which is wonderful. It wires your brain for creativity, which is hard. I'm not going to read this because then we don't have time. But um, here, there's a great poem called So You Want to Be a Writer by Charles Bukowski. It basically says, don't do it. I'll read you the last three lines. Unless the sun inside you is burning your gut, don't do it. Sometimes I wonder if I'm insane. I forgot I'd put that slide in there, but it's true. But I'm happy. You learn communication, which is a saleable skill. I now write, I do, I've done journalism, I, I do marketing, public relations, design work, speaking, management, Leadership, all of these require communication. 
Part two, meaning. I've given you, this has all been about meaning. It's been about growing yourself, maturing so that you have things to say. But here is another word on meaning. This is from, by Francis Beaumont in a letter to Ben Johnson about the Mermaid Tavern, where, you know, him and his buddies like Shakespeare hung out. So nimble and so full of subtle flame, as if that every one from whence they came had meant to put his whole wit in a jest. Hopefully your conversation can be so good that when, and you're so brilliant, that when you turn your conversation into writing, it just works. Best-selling author of all time, Jesus Christ, all dictated. Live well, write hard. That's it from me. Peace out. Any questions? Wow. wow. That's, I mean, any regrets, David? Any regrets? Regret. Yeah, I think regrets you should have done. Could have done, might have done. None. I, I mean, um, so let me just share my camera with you again. Hi. So uh, any regrets? No, I mean, I, I have a wonderful life. I've had, um, you know, I have a family. I have a nice house. I have a great job. And, I, and, and I'm better at writing than I've ever been. Um, and my, my, my path has been um, tortuous. And my favorite people in life, and I know them when I meet them, are the people who have taken a, a circuitous path, a serendipitous circuitous path through life. So I meet marketers and they have always been a marketer and that's just all they know. And they went to university and they studied marketing. And they're, they have a certain level of depth, right? That's all they ever turn their, their mind to. And then I meet people who is like, oh yeah, I used to organize raves and then for a while I owned a bar and, and then I tried to be a tattoo artist and now I'm a marketer. And, and they're, often their work is better and they're more interesting and I flatter myself that I'm sort of among those types of people. And so, absolutely no, I wouldn't change anything. Right, right, right. Um, so, you said you weren't, um, you said you weren't writing literature, but what's your definition of, like, you not writing literature? Yeah, that's writing? interesting. So, um, I don't have a great answer for that, I don't think. Um, except that for me, literature... The primary focus of literature is um, is the character development and the revealing of some fundamental human truth. And for me, I no longer that's for the current book that I'm writing. That's not my current aim. My current aim is to craft a really fantastic story. And for that reason, I put myself into the camp of, of genre writer instead. However, I. Th sort of think I'm in the, on the fence a little because I also very much am interested in the literary aspects of this. I'm tr I'm still I still want it to be beautiful and I still want it to be revealing. Well, thank you. Yes, and that's a question we need to wrap it up and, and move on. I'd just like to say something. Hello, David. I'm Becky's mum. Oh, Becky. Becky's mum. Hi. How's it going? It's so good to see you. I again. Think I'll see her on Saturday. Yes, and I'll tell her. Well, all please about do. You. Please do. I'm actually going. I've actually recorded this. I hope, and I'm going to. I'll send it to Sean, um, so other folks can see if they want. But please email me if you have any questions or thoughts on any of this. I'm totally game to help. My email address is David M for Michael. <laughs> David M for Michael Christopher. Spelled the same way as the first name at yahoo.co.uk David M. Christopher at yahoo.co.uk So thank yeah, you I'll everybody. Make sure that as well. um, thank you very much. It's That's been nice. enjoyable. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.